um, nature finds a way. Different plants actually help to mitigate any pollution, any heavy metals in the soil. Uh, so, without further ado, I shall talk to you about three key areas. One of which is my lifestyle and how I discovered the last art of foraging. The second is a crash course on foraging, so I'm counting on all of you here to get involved because it's a rather sensual activity. I have a few things here for you to try, smell, and feel. And um, finally, I would like to share a few ideas of how rekindling, rekindling our love for wild plants can have a huge impact and create real easy change for a healthier future. So the path that led me toward restoring a vital connection to a lost existence, rekindling my ancestral ties to an instinctual bond with nature, began with a tooth cavity. At this point in my journey, I had heavily questioned the conditioned steps of visiting a dentist. I was no longer keen on having it plugged with a toxic mercury-based filling. Um, so, and so I researched and I researched. The trigger was an, in, was an instinctive nudge that said, hey, if the rest of our body heals naturally and repairs itself, what is so different about our teeth? What I discovered was a balance between a demineralization and a remineralization process. The flow ever changing by the very foods that we choose to consume. So, if you imagine uh, little squares in the enamel, these little squares are filled with the minerals that we eat when we have healthy food, uh, dark greens, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, if you're eating junk food, those holes are not filled. So, eventually, that enamel crumbles away and reveals the dentin underneath. Now, if you've had if you've had a tooth cavity but it has not gone past the dentist and you change your diet, which is what I did, the dentin is hard enough to rebuild itself and protect yourself from the pulp. However, if the, if the cavity goes so far down that it infects the pulp, that is where we have our problems. Infected pulp, inflamed pulp, and you have those toothaches that you can't get rid of. And um, this is where the dentist comes in, drills, out, drills it out and gives you um, what is it called? A boot canal. Boot canal that's what. Right. And um, then you've got a dead tooth. Um, so, flow is an important word to remember. Uh, a word that overrules it in our modern age is preservation, preservatives. We are blocking the flow and instead fill up fill the holes in our teeth that are like the decay. We wear makeup to hide the rot of our flesh and spray chemicals in our glands in a futile attempt to fool ourselves into ignoring every telltale signs of our body screaming for help. So what we have here is relating to the tooth still. So healthy eating, remineralization. Junk food, demineralization. Now if you're changing what you eat, you can continue this continuous cycle. But if you're sticking to unhealthy food, tooth decay, erosion, and preservation at the dentist, and finally, you have a dead tooth. I changed my diet overnight. I adopted for a short while a primal paleo approach towards eating. This involved abandoning all grains, legumes, and potatoes, focusing on a diet of dark greens, daily grown liver broths, um, packed with vegetables, onions, garlic, and ginger. I also ate eggs and bacon every morning <laughs> and fish with salad in the evening. I must emphasize, however, that for the most part, there was no supermarket rubbish that I consumed. I spent a great deal of time researching better sources of foods. Grass-fed, pasture-raised, local, free-range, chemical, pesticide, herbicide-free. They were all key words in the product that I chose to source. And on many occasions, I visited each premises before committing to the, pro to the produce. In those six months, my tooth ceased its decay and I inadvertently lost over three stone in less than five of them. My skin improved and my energy hit the roof. I have never felt better. So if you look at me on the left, you would have never recognised me. <laughs> and um, this is before I started to hit onto forage foods. So due to my abandonment of refined sugars and empty calories, my instinctual awareness deepened and urged me to take the next step on my journey. This happened one day while walking out in the countryside. All these plants that passed me by on a daily basis began to silently talk to me. 
not in some crazy delirious way, and no, I do not indulge in certain mushrooms if that's what they're <laughs> But rather, silent feelers reached into my senses and stole away the blinders. Green, lots of green, healthy looking foliage spread as far as the eye could see. I began picking and smelling it before doing my research to confirm each plant was edible, and lastly enjoy the wild wisdom they would impart upon my senses and in my stomach. Food, real food, and such was the catalyst that enabled me to detach from a consumerist world of an incomplete matrix. For the first time, I experienced the vitality and flow tapping into my existence and restoring a certain connection to the greater picture. This photo I had to ask permission for, so this is credit to Mark of Galloway Wild Foods in Scotland. Um, nature has a flow. It gives and it takes in every area of its realm. This maintains a thriving cycle where almost every resource is the waste of another process. Humans are an anomaly in this cycle. We take and we take, and we do not return enough to replace what we consume. Our waste is not spread, but rather it is concentrated to create a highly toxic sludge that must be dealt with. Returning to this photo again, I wish that was a wild animal, not a cow in the middle of it, but this is the best I can do. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, herds of grazing animals will eat and then poo all over what they have grazed. This re-fertilizes the land, ready for new, healthy growth. The oxygen that we breathe is um, largely the waste of declining trees. How ironic that we cut down and plant with found cropland. We have replaced native woods with dark, empty, silent pine forests, lacking any true flow or vitality of a mixed ancient forest. For what? To cut them down in a decade or two for our ever-growing consumerist needs. Last year was the first year I became fully su sufficient on food, food-wise on the land. After a long break from dairy, I found myself researching the benefits of a good real source of raw milk. Um, this is Annabella here. She was um, we were helping at a small farm um, where we, we checked the sources, we were happy with the cows, and so um, we helped them out for a short while while we attained some milk at the same process at the same time. So um, this translated into a three-month milk fast the winter before last. Just tap it, sorry. <laughs> uh, so what I have here is another photo I just pulled off Google. Um, it gives you a basic example of the difference in raw milk and the difference in pasteurised milk. So there is a reduction in pretty much everything when it comes to pasteurised because they effectively eat it and they kill a lot of the, the lot of the live enzymes and, and nutrition. So in the what I was sorry, this is helpful, but I'm forward a bit. So far, it is the only thing that my body will accept as a staple. I tried potatoes last winter and fell gravely ill, returning exclusively to raw milk as my calorie source. And we're talking about a set of potatoes a day to get it to the staple. <laughs> um, I realised that too many carbohydrates translate into issues like fatty liver disease. So um, the burger and the chips that resemble all your grains, your potatoes, and excessive amounts, this is what it can create. Um, non alcohol fatty liver disease. I, I, this is another thing I pulled off of you, really could do with some research. But um, apparently, this is what leads to things like breast cancer, renal cancer, um, colon <laughs> cancer, intestinal well, micro. Um, pancreat pancreatic cancer, um, gastric cancer, prostate cancer. So, if you've got the imbalance, um, usually your liver will tell you first. Um, it also can lead to cholesterol, gout, obesity, and diabetes because. Our liver actually regulates our dietary cholesterol. Um, in the wild, uh, strong sources of carbohydrates either require lots of processing or are available in short seasonal windows like food. So what we have up here is cattail rhizomes. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this on 10,000 BC, have you watched that? Um, it's a TV series where they send 21st century people into the wild in the hopes of living as they did in the um, hunter gatherer days. I've heard about the Welsh one. Ah, I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Yeah>. But <laughs> uh, 
So with, the, with, with these rhizomes, um, it will take a bit of processing. If you want to get the starchy flour from there, you have to beat, you have to beat the uh, rhizome to a pulp, uh, get all this, grind this all down, um, and then you have to sit that in water, let the starch drop to the bottom, and let that dry out, and you've got your, um, you've got your flour. Uh, so um, in the wild, um, so I said that. So I also chose milk because in the right manner, retaining milk does not disrupt the flow of nature. And these are our own goats. I have proof of this through experimentation last year, having my own goat herd with access to 30 acres of diverse and rich nature reserve. The goats were taken off commercial crop food and set free up on the land. They developed their established browsing groups over the whole area and could thrive 100% from nature without disrupting its flow, even through winter months. And at the bottom picture here, you see Margot. Um, she came with that name. <laughs> so if you have a look at her here, this is when we first, when she first arrived on the land. Um, when we took her off the commercial food grains, we noticed with all our goats that they shrink the next day, and you notice how much they actually need. Um, so this is her, um, just beginning mid-winter, after living on the nature reserve for about five or six months. And you can see the difference in her health and condition. The number of goats in milk during the summer totaled seven, producing nearly 15 litres a day of peak. I only need four of these, so imagine the scope of how many that could provide for. I've yet to find another example of the goat paradise my herd have access to. They come running when cool, then even jump willingly onto the milk stand to be milked. It is a balanced, healthy relationship which results in a fair exchange and a revitalizing source of true milk. <laughs> um, I realise that there is a lot being said about milk consumption, but that is, an, that is another discussion for another day. Another concern is that our diet consists mostly of grass seed. This includes rice, wheat and corn, of which most products in the supermarket shelf are formulated from. There is a video titled From Wild to Tame and Back Again. Uh, it is worth a watch. You'll find it on my uh, Facebook page feed, which you'll find the link for at the end. The speaker states that even apes do not eat that stuff, but he used a, slight, he used a slightly vulgar word beginning in S and ending in T. Um, it, is it is worrying that the very process of agriculture, on the whole, is at the verge of desertifying our soils. Now, if you see the desert across the middle belt of the earth, Apparently, this was once prime habitat, prime land, and um, I, I would bet that it was because of the civilizations around this area. No matter how much technology you can, can you, you can devise, if you run out of soil, you run out of food. How can we continue? Okay, so another another cons oh, um, and um, another thing that he mentions in the talk is that our bodies are 98% replaced each year. So if we are only eating a select few crops, a select few cultivated vegetables, that could possibly, with a little research, explain um, any degenerative diseases that we find when we reach an older age. Uh, so, which is where I return to my story. Last year I lived off nothing but raw goat's milk, foraged wild plants, and I only ate meat on the rare occasion that I hunted. I forgot to change one word where I said nothing there, because right here, as you can see, there was a little bit of sourdough bread. <laughs> so that we indulged in that once in a blue moon. Um, so what you've got on top of that is wild garlic butter. Um, up here you have uh, like a berry, wild berry yogurt, wild cherries, Goat, our own goat cheese with bulrush flowers, uh, wild strawberries, they're so small but they pack just as much flavour or even more than the, than the cultivated kind. And what we have here is thistles. So we blend the thistles up, strain it through a milk, milk um, nut back filter, and we end up with this beautiful green thistle juice. And these are not chicken eggs, they are pigeon eggs. So the next, oh, they're amazing. <laughs> and up here, we have uh, pine needles, rose hips, and cleavers, translating into pine needle juice, uh, cleaver juice, and that is rose hip yogurt. I have tried the pine needles. <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah, that's right. The sisters said, like lemon, it's really nice. They're rich in vitamin C. Yeah, they're really nice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you're not squeamish. Um, my diet was 99% raw throughout the spring and summer months. Meat in my diet was a rarity. After all, it is not a simple task hunting without traps, which I prefer to stay without. Um, I prefer to use my bare hands, proof being when I trapped down and chased and caught a muntjac deer without any long-range weapons. Usually, if the instinctual pull towards me takes me, I have a small game with an air rifle, nothing more than the odd one every few weeks since I have raw milk and wild forage at my disposal. My body requires little else, and this was supposed to be now. I suppose there is no real term to my diet, perhaps a true natural one at least. Everything other than the raw milk and the olive vinegar <coughs> for dressings in for salads is wild. Um, eventually, we would love to make the vinegars and, and the oils ourselves from wild foods, which has been done by a chap called Miles Irving, Forager UK, down at the bottom of England. Um, he actually supplies gourmet restaurants with all the forage that he collects and um, vinegars and ferments. Um, quite an amazing chap. Um, before I visited Leeds, I had been travelling up and down the coastline, foraging an abundance of three-cornered garlic, Alexander's, seaweed, wild cabbage, uh, rock samphire, and quite a few other plants. I have eaten local fish when I had no luck fishing, but it was still wild from the nearby oceans. Okay, so what we have in this photo is uh, it's like a wild pesto with three-cornered garlic, Alexander's, olive, mustard, um, dressing with a bit of water. Um, outside here, this is, you have to go to this place actually, in Leeds, Penraven Industrial Estate, there's a lady called Nina, and she's opened a wild craft food cafe. So when she gets the chance, she goes out and forages foods, she candies them, she ferments them, she makes preserves. So if you're over that way, pop in and see her. What about Cesar? Um, Pen Raven Way is towards Leanwood. So it's not, it's not all that far. So, so what we have here is um, the forage salad that we actually fed the homeless in Congress. Um, we have Alexander leaves, uh, all, all penny wort, um, three cornered garlic, gorse flowers with an olive mustard seed dressing. I can't remember what's in this, but that was what they served us when we went to see the foragers down in Canterbury. Um, there's a chickweed in there, I know, and possibly sea person. Um, and this is seaweed. And what you'd be interested to know is that seaweed is the wild ancestor of Swiss chard, um, beetroot, all of those, all of that family. So you could utilise this just as easily, and apparently it grows just as well inland. Got to find a few seeds and plant them in. Really? Yep. Wow. <laughs> I'm, go I'm going to experiment with that this year. And there's one final, and there's one, there's one final comment to this part of my talk is that while people struggle over a salad crisis in supermarkets, for me and the abundant wild forage under many of our noses, what salad crisis? I say. So, what we are moving on to now is a crash, sort of a crash course in foraging. Before I jump into the sensory and active part of this talk, uh, there's a few things we must be aware of. It is well, it's all well and good running through the grass and amongst the trees, picking all things green and mushroomy, but one mistake in some cases will end that adventure rather quickly. There are a few toxic plants in nature compared to what is edible, however, there are few, um, so however, knowing what to look out for is essential to safely foraging and free food. So, um, don't take this the wrong way, if you've been associated with foraging, but it says be 100% certain before swallowing. Um, it is a, a be mindful of nature. Oh, I've written this the wrong way around. It is, uh, <laughs> yeah, hang on, yes, I've missed this paragraph, that is why. Um, I, I advise that you do not put anything in your mouth that you are not 100% aware of. Um, and in some cases, um, like the carrot family, you must ensure 110% clarity uh, before attempting this family because although many rewards are to be had, it holds some of the deadliest plants in existence, such as hemlock. 
Um, be mindful of nature. The more you connect instinctually to your surroundings, it is unlikely that you would cause harm to the very thing that sustains you. Um, do not uproot a whole patch, um, but harvest three quarters of the way down the stem, allowing room for regrowth. Um, and let the plants eventually seed before winter so the cycle can continue. Ask permission from the landowner. Um, seek consent to avoid any kind of trespassing. However, this should not really exist. As long as you're not causing harm to the land, you should be allowed to move freely, like they do in Scotland. <laughs> um, be wary of the environment. Always try to seek the cleanest possible area of wild plants. Use your common sense here. You wouldn't pick a plant next to a huge dollop of dog poo, would you? <laughs> um, now, let's get on to the slightly more exciting part. So, using your senses. First, you pick a leaf, pick a plant, touch it, crush it, as well as look at it, and then next you smell it. If it smells toxic, drop it and move on. Rub the crushed plant on a sensitive area, such as your wrist or your lips. Wait, research, be 100%. And finally, taste it. And I'll probably end up choking if I'm talking at the same time, so I won't do that. <laughs> but I'll taste it. So if no, if no adverse reaction so far, um, chew for a while, get a feel for the plant, and spit it out. If you are 100% certain of its identification, then swallow a small amount and wait for any adverse reaction. A small amount is unlikely to cause more than an upset stomach. Okay, so what we have here is a few things. We have wild alexanders, of which I have some stems here to pass around. So what I would like you to do is first of all, you can, first of all, if I have one cut this sand, if you take a piece, crush it, smell it, and I can assure you can eat these, so stick it in your mouth and have a chew and see what you think. And if you take one piece, pass it round. And what I'll do from the back, if you have a look at this, this is a kind of plant. So it's if you look at the leaf structure, observe the stalk, um, it is unlikely that you'll mistake this for any other part of the cat family. Um, looks more like cow's, cow's parsley. Um, I don't have a photo to show anyone. But yes, that's exactly, it tastes like celery. And um, imagine how many uses you could use for this. You could get this for free. But it grows, if this Alexander's growing over the coastline, so um, if you head out towards Whitby Scarborough Way, if you go down to Scarborough Castle, they are littered all over the base of Scarborough Castle. Oh, okay. Who hasn't had a who hasn't had a sample? Yeah. Oh, the cup's over there, so I'll put the around the back just to give it a Take a uh, take a stem. If you crush it. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I think I think it depends on your taste, but it's different for everyone. Um, and what I have here is a, something that people love in conventional foods. Can you guess what it is? Yeah. Okay. Is that dot leaf? No. Uh, no uh, dandelion leaf? No. It might help if you actually show people. Okay, it is. It is oh, yeah, actually, I'll give, I'll give you one. Smell that. Can someone else guess? Have a smell. Garlic. Garlic, yes. This is this is wild garlic. Um, Mountain moss. Oh, there's the uh, Alexander's. Um, so if I can crush it. Crush it. Um, smell it. And this stuff, I can tell you, grows everywhere 
um, around Leeds. Um, there's a lot of places, uh, as long as you've got damp, damp wetlands, near a stream, woodlands, loves moist ground. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Oh, it's very cheap for that because you know what garlic is. Um, the only thing you have to be careful is not to mistake it with Lily of the Valley, which um, up north way apparently it is quite rare, so you shouldn't have too much of an issue. The difference with Lily of the Valley, however, is that there's two leaves that are jointed right here and they come out in a pair. And it does not smell of garlic. That's the biggest telltale sign. Um, and also the leaf structure, it has, uh, it has a more closely knit veined leaf structure when you look at um, Lily of the Valley. <laughs> um, now this here, I've made a tea out of this. Um, have you ever found the sticky grass? Um, the, the goose grass cleavers, um, it sticks to you when you walk past it and it's got those little seedy birds that um, now another, another thing you can do with this, when it seeds, collect the seeds, dry them up and ground them into a coffee substitute. Seriously? Yeah. My kids roll them at me. Yeah, you can make that into coffee. Yeah. Oh. Um, so what I shall do here, I have, two, I have two kinds of teas. One of them is cleavers. Now the amazing benefit of um, cleaver tea is that it cleans out your lymph system. So, um, in terms of your immunity, if you have this every day, and you can also use it for skin conditions too, make the juice out of it, rub it over, rub it over your skin. Yes, what, what I'm going to ask here is that um, each of you yes, um, try and smell it. So this one here is beech leaf tree. Um, the beech leaves have been drying over winter naturally. So I've simply picked them and experimented. Um, I was inspired by this by another forager, Robin Harford. Um, it's worth following him because he posts a lot of um, email links about things he does. Um, so if I pass you this, um, if you have, have a whiff and then have a sip and pass it on. And this, this is the cleavers, this is the beach. Smells familiar. And just while, just while the team is passing around this way, what we have here, you find in the high grounds. Um, do you know? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, that was good for okay. me. Cleavers are good for lymphatic system. So, and the video, um, for those watching the video that I'm going to upload later, um, we skipped a little bit of the uh, foraging side of things. Um, <coughs> apparently, we're not allowed to film other people, so. <laughs> You've got some of this on your Facebook page as well. I do, yes. Um, you'll see the details at the end. Um, so foraging in the modern world, how can it, how can it bring real change? <laughs> I, hope, I hope that many, many of you have been able to feel and taste the vitality of um, what these wild plants have to offer. Um, I would like for a moment for you to quieten your minds and imagine what I'm about to describe. Imagine a city where every green space is not just grass. A city that is with edible wild plants, with their many unique flavours and scents growing effortlessly. Wild fruit bushes and trees would provide some shade for those edible weeds that prefer such locations. Imagine skyscrapers dedicated to forest and many varying wild habitats on every level. Human waste can be pumped through the top and filter through the soil, fertilizing the ground and restoring that flow through every herb and fruit we pick. The water at the bottom would be filtered naturally and be clean to drink once more without the chemicals. <coughs> Imagine steel nettles for paper, but also to replace cars that are on the oil industry. <coughs> Ford built a hemp car in the early 20th century and ran it on hemp ethanol. <coughs> Now, unfortunately, the, um, it, would, it would have been a huge impact on the oil industry at the time, so that was scrapped. Um, and uh, nettles being native and closely related to hemp um, could perhaps be such a resource with a little research. Perhaps there could be cars running on water, like standard mayor's water car, 
um, as well as many other technologies that can be utilized to free us from oil. Imagine a world where we left the wild back in, where we simply had to walk out our door to pick a wild salad in the middle of a thriving city. Wild plants could thrive without effort or intensive methods required to ensure their abundance. Does this kind of world seem far-fetched? The cars and technology, perhaps, but not as far as you might imagine. Change is easy, and set the roll balling. Set, set, set the ball rolling. It requires little effort on any individual's part. If every individual here began to spread native wild edible seeds, many of which we consider to be weeds, within a year new growth would soon appear, and within five years abundance of free wild food would be on your doorstep, in the neighbour's garden, in the nearby waste ground, in the local park, everywhere. The word weeds. Um, the word weeds, it is a clever word to discuss that persuasive little plant, trying ever so hard to tell us that we need it. Instead, we ignore it by spraying swathes of land with toxic weed killer and planting poisonous, inevitable cultivated plants for what? Aesthetics. Weeds are just as pretty when they flower, and this is wild garlic, but the difference is they have a use. A powerful use that nobody wants us to know about. They are freedom. They are health. And by simply tuning in and listening to what they have to share with us, we will step upon a journey of independence. Wild food is one of the key stones that has been made slightly knocked to the side. It is replaced by supermarket chains and all for profit industry, including pharmaceuticals. And so I leave you with this, this final thought with you. In order to change the world, and in order to bring about the change each and every one of you are invested to make a reality, let it begin with the first cornerstone, that's food, wild, raw, healthy, abundant food. Let us come together and restore the wild in our cities and all things urban. Let us create real change. Thank you.